In the big book of Christian mysticism, the following is stated. It's important to note that throughout the history of Christianity, Christian mystics, you get that, Christian mystics have displayed an unusual openness to the wisdom of non-Christian philosophy and religion. In other words, Christian mysticism seems from the beginning to have had an intuitive recognition of the way in which mysticism is a form of unity that transcends religious difference. The 20th century may go down in history as the great age of interreligious spirituality, and many others expressing their Christian faith in ways that reveal the influence of wisdom traditions such as Sufism, Vedanta, or Zen. Now, Sufism, that, that's the mysticism of Islam. Okay, Vedanta is the mysticism of Hinduism, and of course Zen is the mysticism of Buddhism. So he's saying that these mystics, these people that we're dealing with here, the contemplative prayer movement, in other words, express their Christian faith in ways that reveal the influence of non-Christian religions. So you may ask yourself, well, how is that possible? Well, it isn't possible. You can't have the preaching of the cross mixed in with religions that reject the preaching of the cross and say that man is God. It just can't be done. Brian McLaren endorses the big book of Christian mysticism, and this is what he says. Before I heard about the big book of Christian mysticism, I had been thinking about how such a book has been needed for a long time. Now, having read it, I'm glad we waited for Carl McCullman to come along to write it. It's accessible, human, well-informed, balanced, broad, just what we needed. Brian McLaren read that part about the unity of uh, Christian mystics with non-Christian mystics, and it made him like the book. You know, if, if you really believe in the Great Commission, if you really believe that a Christian should go out and preach the gospel to every creature, like Jesus said, when you read something like that, you would find it, un, you know, uh, unacceptable. But Brian McLaren found, found it to be not only acceptable, but exemplary. Tony Campolo says, A theology of mysticism provides some hope for common ground between Christianity and Islam. Both religions have within their histories examples of ecstatic union with God which seem to be at odds with their own spiritual traditions but have much in common with each other. I do not know what to make of the Muslim mystics, especially those who have come to be known as the Sufis. What did they experience in their mystical experience? Could they have encountered the same God we do in our Christian mysticism? No. The Bible says that whoever does not have the Son, as the religion of Islam, does not have the Father. So, if these mystics are encountering the same spiritual being, it's not God. I'm not convinced that Jesus only lives in Christians. Okay. There's the difference. But you've got to have Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is my Savior. Okay. Brian McLaren says, During his lifetime, Abraham, like Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, had an encounter with God that distinguished him from his contemporaries and propelled him into a mission introducing a new way of life that changed the world. How appropriate that the three Abrahamic religions begin with a journey into the unknown. He celebrates Ramadan because he wants to celebrate Muhammad's reception of the Quran. Does Brian McLaren really believe that? Uh, I have to ask that because Muhammad felt that he was possessed by a demon when he received the Quran, when he was receiving these revelations. They cover him up, he uh, would stand on a cliff, wanted to commit suicide. He felt that he had been was possessed by a demon. Would be on the ground, would be frothing at the mouth. Many Islamic scholars point out that he felt he was possessed by a demon. He was convinced by his wife that no, you're probably hearing from the angel Gabriel. He begins to write the very things that the scriptures tell us are the doctrines of demons. The Quran denies the deity of Jesus Christ and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, whereas. The Bible says that Jesus is both God and man, and says there is no salvation apart from the cross. He wrote about, over and over again, Jesus, you know, is not God, uh, that he wasn't crucified for our sins, and uh, claimed this came from Gabriel. And he, throughout the Quran you read that Jesus isn't the Son of God, and he didn't die for our sins. I find that interesting, that this supposedly came from Gabriel, 
when we only have two revelations from Gabriel, one in Daniel chapter 9 and one in the first couple chapters of Luke. And in the two revelations we have from the angel Gabriel, he teaches in Daniel 9 that the Messiah will be cut off, not for himself, but for our sins. Jesus, he, he, he gives the very year of Christ's crucifixion, hundreds of years before it takes place, Daniel chapter 9. Uh, and when you read the early chapters of Luke and you read what happened with regard to the celebration of the incarnation, uh, Gabriel reveals that uh, to Mary that she will bear a son and he will be the son of the Most High God. So here Gabriel tells us that Jesus will be the son of the Most High God and that he will atone for our sins on the cross. The Quran is inspired by a spirit and it's written like a war manual against Jews and Christians and, and against Christians in regard to their holding to Jesus being the Son of God and dying for our sins. And yet, Brian McLaren is celebrating uh, the reception of that book. And in the scripture, it's identified in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, that whoever denies the Father and the Son, that relationship with the Father and the Son, that that is Antichrist. Leonard Sweet is a Methodist, and he thinks Mohammed was, was this great light, and he writes the union of the human with the divine, which is the center feature of all the world's religions. He says it was experienced by Muhammad, Moses, Krishna, some of the new light leaders, he calls them. Here, Leonard Sweet writes, One can be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ without denying the flickers of the sacred in the followers of Yahweh, Kali, or Krishna. So we have uh, not only Islam integrated in emerging, we've got Hinduism. Probably everybody has seen that on television where people sit around in a, a, a position that's outlined by yoga. There usually is a hands raised up in receptivity that's also taught in contemplative prayer in which uh, hopefully you just simply go blank. And then in yoga, you're meeting up with a Hindu deity. In Christianity, supposedly you're meeting up with Christ. And so these mystical practices have much overlap the key is they're never taught in scripture. In yoga, one of the central tenets of yoga is your breath needs to remain the same. It's not how flexible you are. It's not whether you can do the poses. It's not how much you can bend yourself. It's can you keep your breath consistent through whatever you're doing. And the yoga masters say this is how it is when you follow Jesus and surrender to God is it's your breath being consistent. It's your connection with God, regardless of the pose you find yourself in. That's integrating the divine into the daily. On a CNN segment called, Does God Approve of Yoga? John MacArthur and Doug Padgett debated about whether or not yoga was dangerous for the Christian faith. Why would Christians want to borrow an expression from a false religion, uh, from pantheism. God is everything, you're God, everything is God. When we believe there's only one true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, why would we need to import that? If you want to exercise, exercise, but why borrow a term that has been part of a false religion for centuries? Doug Pangel, let's get you in on this. And, and as we do, I want to read the definition from Webster's on uh, yoga. It, it says it's a Hindu theistic philosophy teaching the suppression of all activity of body mind and will in order that the self may realize its distinction from men and attain liberation on a on a spiritual front for a christian right. that does not sound like christ-centered faith to me on the surface of that definition what's going on here help us out well for people who, pre who perform yoga what they're normally trying to do is to find a whole and complete and healed life so when people participate in yoga, most of them aren't on some kind of a yoga agenda. What they're trying to do is use whatever practices they can find that would help them have a whole and complete life. And for a Christian, that's certainly what we're after. The, the Jesus agenda is a whole life, is a complete life, is a healed life. So when people use it to relieve stress, to be healthy in their relationships, to feel good in their body, that's a really good thing. Is all yoga bad yoga for the Christian? Well, let, let me just respond to what, what I've been hearing. Uh, that doesn't sound anything like Christianity. If you want a whole life, if you want your life to be what it should be, you don't put yourself in some weird physical position, empty your mind, center on yourself, and find a try to relieve your stress. 
you go to the Word of God, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you embrace in faith the sacrifice of Christ in His death and resurrection as your Savior and Redeemer. God comes, regenerates you, transforms your life, makes you a new creation, and you're saved, and you're on your way to heaven, and you can live a life of peace and joy. That's the promise of the gospel. There is no contribution made to that by any physical position or any kind of uh, meditation. The idea of Christianity is to fill your mind with biblical truth and focus on the God who is above you. That's Christian worship. The idea of yoga is to fill your mind with nothing except to focus on yourself and try to find the God that is inside of you. From a Christian viewpoint, that's a false religion. Gentlemen. Exercise is a different issue. Gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. Pastor Doug Padgett and John MacArthur, we appreciate your time, both of you. Thank you very, thank you very much. So what are you playing? I'm just kind of messing around, improvising, really. Mm -hmm. That reminds me a little bit of Chapter Eight, the future question. Yeah, that's right. It's it's a chapter about eschatology, our, our understanding of the future. For a lot of people, it means, do we believe the Bible predicts the future? That kind of a thing. And you're right; it is a little bit similar to a song because, for a lot of people, the uh, to believe in God means to believe that history is like a song that's already composed, already written, and the notes are just playing. Whereas I'm proposing something kind of different in the chapter. Brian McLaren says that if Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming with his mighty angels and flaming fire to judge the wicked, that, well, you know, then he's a jihadist Jesus. He believes that traditional eschatology, that the Lord is going to return to the earth, is pretty skewed. That, uh, that really this isn't going to happen at all. He says the world it will get worse and worse, and finally this jihadist Jesus will return and use force domination, violence, and even torture, the ultimate imperial tools to vanquish evil and bring peace. He says such a view is not only ignorant and wrong, but dangerous and immoral. So he, he believes anybody that believes Jesus is going to return and set up a new heaven and a new earth, uh, they're, they're not only wrong, they're dangerous and immoral. The scriptures are clear he is coming back with his mighty angels in flaming fire to judge the wicked. So he, he doesn't believe in the Lord returning in judgment. As a matter of fact, judgment is pretty much airbrushed out of the whole system. This is what Jesus said would happen. Jesus said things would get worse and worse. The Apostle Paul said things would get worse as well. Second Timothy chapter 3, uh, he said, You know this, that in latter days or the last days, terrible or perilous times would come. Men would be lovers of self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. He said, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Storge is a Greek word there, uh, without, without family love, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, inconvenient, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, i.e., so much of the emergent church, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Then he goes on to say in verse 12, uh, a little bit later, he says, and all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus, really seek to follow the Lord and follow his word, they will suffer persecution. But he goes on to say in verse 13, the very next verse, but evil men and impostors will wax worse and worse. That's not an interpretation, that's just what he says. That's what Jesus said. I think what's unique about the book I wrote is that I actually find where this all came from. Okay, it's pretty rare that somebody just all of a sudden shows up with a brand new idea nobody else had. It does happen. But I just didn't believe that these guys all came up with a new idea. I, I believed it came from somewhere. Brian McLaren noted in a 2004 article called The Emergent Matrix, A New Kind of Church. We realized very early on that we weren't going to find the intellectual resources we needed in the evangelical world. So we were either going to have to create them or borrow them. It turned out that a lot of us were reading the same people who were more respected in the mainline world such as Walter Brueggemann, Jürgen Moltmann, and Stanley Heuerwas. What happened is we started to identify ourselves as post-conservative, and then we found out that there was an almost parallel movement going on in the post-liberal world, and the affinities that we had were very, very strong. There's the theological source for the emergent church is a, a German theologian by the name of Jürgen Moltmann. 